Okay. So we are going to discuss today twist uh, storing polymers, and we already have seen uh, bending the formation in polymers. Today we are going to see uh, what a twist is. Okay, and these are the topic of this uh, of this lecture. All right. So we consider continuous model of polymers, which are described by a function r of s. R is the position of uh, the polymer. And this is a continuous curve, S is a curvilinear coordinate parameterizing the arc length. So inextensible means that the derivative of R with respect of S is a unit vector, or in other words, that the length of the vector dr, the increment, is equal to ds. Okay, so we restrict ourselves to inextensible polymers. And, uh, of course, we have to deal with uni vec unit vectors that are two useful properties. We are not going to uh, show these uh, properties, demonstrate this property, but the proof is very easy. First property is that the derivative of a unit vector is orthogonal to the vector. So we take a unit vector, we differentiate the scalar product with the vector itself is equal to zero. The second property is that if two vectors, any vectors A and, a and B, are orthogonal to each other uh, for all s, then the derivative of the first vector, uh, scalar product with the second vector, is equal minus the derivative of the second vector, scalar product with the first vector. Okay, so we are going to use the, these two properties. So we are going to construct an orthonormal frame from u of s. u of s is the tangent, of course, of our curve. Okay, and is the first vector of our frame, but we want to construct three orthonormal vectors from it. And we construct the second vector by taking the derivative of, um, of u with respect of s. So the first property tells us that this derivative is orthogonal. So this derivative is not in general a unit vector. Is not a unit vector also because it has dimension. Unit vector has dimension, but when we differentiate with respect of length, we get a quantity that has the dimension of an inverse of a length. Okay, but uh, nonetheless, this this vector, I can uh, construct from this vector, from this derivative, a unit vector, which is uh, as length one. Okay, so here k is defined as a positive number, and it's what is called a curvature. It's a good reason to uh, to call it a curvature because it can be easily shown that this k kappa sorry kappa is equal to one over r, where r is the local radius of curvature of our uh, curve. Okay, so now we have u vector u the tangent, the n vector which is perpendicular to u. Uh, which defines two uh, orthogonal vectors, and we can construct, we can compl complete this frame, this triad, with uh, the vector, unit vector B, which we just uh, complete this triad by taking the cross product of this uh, U and N. Okay, so now we have for every continuous curve, just by, you know, when we have r is a function of s, we take one derivative, we define the tangent, then we have defined n and b. n is called the normal, and b is called the binormal, and u is the tangent, unit tangent vector, okay? So here, this curve, and this animation comes from Wikipedia, shows this triad, this three vector, namely the tangent, the normal, and the binormal for um, a specific curve. In this example, this is an helix. Okay, so we see here the tangent is the blue vector. The normal is the red vector. And the binormal is perpendicular to the two, and it's the black vector. Okay, so imagine now that you can do this for any um, any any kind of curve, you can do the same uh, the same type of transformation. <coughs> All right. Okay. So we have now we can continue with with we we can continue with our analysis and uh, from the properties of the previous slides 
uh, we uh, can show that the derivative of the normal with respect of S, uh, okay, we know that this will be an orthogonal vector, this is orthogonal to N. So this vector will have components along the U and the B, but not along N, because it has to be orthogonal to N, okay? And uh, the property, the second property of the previous uh, page, <coughs> previous slide, tells us that this component with respect of U must be equal to minus kappa, minus the curvature, okay? And generically, there will be uh, a component Q uh, of, um, of um, uh, length Q for with in, in the other direction, in the binormal direction, okay? And also, from the definition of, uh, of B, binormal, we have seen the definition of binormal in the previous slides is the cross product of U with N. If we differentiate this binormal, we get, by the chain rule, two contributions, but the first of the two is zero because the UDS is proportional to N. So this is, uh, these two vectors are parallel. So this, uh, this, um, this cross product is, uh, is zero and we have only component on the other one. Okay, so we have U cross the NDS, but for the NDS we can use this. You see that the first of the two is zero and only the second remains. So because B is binormal, U cross product with B is minus N, okay? So it's minus Q. So in other words, if we take the equation of the previous slide with these two new equations, we have a set of three equations that describe the evolution of uh, the tangent, uh, derivative of the tangent of the normal of the binormal as a function. It's a linear uh, combination of the other three vectors and this Kappa, we have already seen what kappa means. Kappa is uh, the curvature, and Q is a new parameter. It's called a torsion. Of course, these two number for a very generic curve will depend on S, and we can can be very complicated. You can imagine a curve. Uh, the curvature, you know, can can vary in, in general. Generically, will vary in uh, uh, as a function of S, and also Q. Q will be a generic function of S. What, what is the meaning of the torsion? The torsion is somehow a measure of the non-planarity of the curve. So as soon as the curve is flat on a plane, it's easy to show, to show that this um, torsion, the torsion is equal to zero. Okay, <coughs> so we can now give two very simple examples. So let's consider a circle. You know, you can, you can write the equation of a circle and ask yourself what is kappa and what is Q for the circle. You find that for a circle, planar circle, okay, so kappa is a constant and it's a radius of curvature, one over r, the radius of the circle, uh, where r is the radius of the circle, and Q is equal to zero. The torsion is zero for a circle because the circle is planar. For an helix, which is uh, somehow a combination of, uh, you know, a circle with somehow an uh, motion in the in the third direction, you find that kappa is also a constant, uh, positive, because it always is defined as a positive, but also Q in general, the torsion is some, some constant, can be positive or, or negative, okay? And here, this is another animation of, from Wikipedia. So what this curve is, is a knot, okay? This is called a torus knot. You see that uh, it's, it's a knotted curve, okay? For us, now the colors have, have changed, okay? So the tangent is the yellow one. Uh, the normal is green, and the binormal is the blue vector, okay? And here, the two parameters, curvature and torsion, are shown as a function of S. Uh, as the curve is described, is not is, is described, so this is the evolution. So, And I think you can see that there are, the curvature is in green, so more or less the, the curvature is quite, you know, it varies a little, okay? Uh, but the torsion, uh, it's, it's spiking here when, you know, when the torsion measures uh, how 
how fast these binormal changes, right? This is the, the coefficient of the torsion, okay? So when this blue vector it's, remains on the same, uh, maintains the same uh, orientation, this blue uh, unit vector, okay, then is, uh, is the torsion equal to zero, but, you know, when, the, when this, this one tilts, then you get a very strong contribution to the torsion. All right. Okay, so we have constructed the first frame and note that this frame was uh, it's called the Frenet's array frame U, N and B was constructed only on the basis of the knowledge of the tangent of the vector, the tangent of the, uh, sorry, of the polymer. All right, now we're going to, uh, to see what the Darboux frame is. Okay, so again, the Frenet's array frame is fully constructed from the tangent. But if the polymer has an inner structure, uh, is it possible to, to associate a physical frame to it? So an example here is given, uh, is taken from, from DNA. So, okay, so the DNA is a double helix. Okay, so we know how to define, to define a tangent vector to it. Okay, but these two helix, helices, uh, uh, so if I cut this, uh, this, uh, this DNA at some position here, and I look uh, from uh, this, uh, this double helix from above, these two strands, okay, they are not, uh, yeah, okay, so I see these two strands as, as two points here. They are not coming out uh, in, um, in a diameter op op opposite to this circle, okay, so this is the circular section of the double helix, but they form uh, uh, what is called a major and a minor group. So they're slightly tilted. That's why one of the two uh, subhelices is, uh, is slightly shifted with respect to the other. So it's not exactly, you know, this distance here is different than this distance. So you have a major and a minor group, but this is a, a bit of a detail at this point. But okay, so given the orientation of these uh, of these grooves and so on, we can always define uh, another uh, set of orthogonal vector like E1 and E2. Okay, so this is the convention for the DNA, but for a generic polymer with an internal structure, I can always find uh, uh, find an internal frame. That now this this frame as uh, is um, describing. So okay. Uh, a deformation of this frame is describes, for instance, the twist, uh, the real physical twist of the polymer. Okay, so now now we define okay in this way uh, a local orthonormal frame E1, E2, and E3. Okay, so where E3 by definition I choose the tangent of the polymer. So this E3 will be equal to the U unit vector U of the Frenet's array frame, okay, but E1 and E2, they will be different, okay, they will be orthogonal, so to each other and to E3, so E1 and E2, E3 is orthonormal, okay, so Frenet's array and their both frames are connected by a rotation of E1 and E2 with respect to the axis E3, uh, such that uh, this rotation involves the two vector uh, E1 and E2, Okay, and the generic rotation can be written as a matrix multiplication in this way. Okay, this is a rotation of an angle theta of n and b uh, that brings them to uh, e1 and e2. Okay, and of course, uh, this angle theta will depend on s. Okay, but uh, I, I generically will have an angle theta that, uh, that makes this rotation at any point along, along the curve. Okay, so now. We have seen in the previous slide the Frenesser equations that describe the derivative of n, p, and u with respect of s. Okay, by using this transformation, I can also find correspondent equation from the Frenesser equations. I can also derive quite easily uh, equations of evolution for e1, e2, and e3, and these are given here. Okay. And uh, so I have derivative of E1. Huh? It's, it's a combination of these two vectors. And we have seen the properties of unit vectors. The derivative of a unit vector is orthogonal to the vector itself. 
therefore this derivative cannot contain e1 right component along e1 the derivative of e2 cannot contain component along e2 right and so on for e3 okay and uh, this is the connection between the two and here i uh, find back the parameters the curvature and the torsion of the Fresnel frame Fresnel equations okay uh, and they enter in this uh, in this new set of equations okay and together with that what enters is also the derivative okay all right so we can write this set of differential equation also in a compact form okay as a matrix multiplication right so i have an equation d e1 d e2 d e3 okay and each of them it's uh, a linear combination of uh, other uh, unit vectors so i can write it like this as a matrix okay this matrix and because of these orthogonality properties okay so i said that d e1 cannot have component along e1 so the diagonal is equal to uh, zero and this this is a matrix this matrix m is anti-symmetric exactly you, you see it uh, here uh, nicely uh, this anti-symmetry uh, that's right so that's that's why so this this matrix has is um, is um, anti-symmetric so the uh, transposed elements have uh, are not they have uh, identical with the negative sign okay so it's actually this matrix actually has three only three independent uh, variables which i called omega one omega two and omega three and what it turns out that if you do the matrix multiplication here is equivalent and can be shown very easily to make uh, if i take a vector I take these three these three elements, I call them omega, omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3, I make a vector out of them, capital, this uh, bold vector omega, and I take the cross product with EI, okay, it's, it's, it's exactly the same as this, uh, this matrix multiplication, okay, so there are two different notation, and this notation is very convenient also with this, uh, this matrix multiplication, all right, so, this is a recapitulation okay so what we have found is that this now this darbu frame this uh, physical frame describing the our polymer uh, evolves according to this uh, to this equation so we have defined a new vector omega is also called a darbu vector and this omega has three components omega 1 omega 2 and omega 3 and if i look at the previous slide i find that omega 1 and omega 2 are kappa sin theta and kappa cos theta and omega 3 is d theta or ds so you see that omega 1 and omega 2 they also combine in the following way so if i take omega 1 square plus omega 2 squares i get exactly the frenesary curvature okay so the omega 1 and omega 2 i already uh, you know from this this type of formulation i already see that this has to do with with the bending of the polymer omega 3 is different right it is related to the torsion to the Fresnel torsion and it has also this contribution from the derivative of theta and of s we'll see that this has to do with the twist okay and we can see it right uh, in a simple way okay so let's discuss the first situations okay i have the this differential equation one here and i'm asking so what does it mean this equation one if i take for the vector omega a constant not only a constant vector so independent on s okay but only uh, omega 3 okay so i assume that omega is just omega 3 omega 1 and omega 2 components are equal to zero and omega 3 is a constant independent on s Okay, for this choice of omega, I can solve easily this differential equation, and the solution is the following. Okay, I leave this solution as an exercise. The solution is that E3, first of all, is a constant. Okay, and I choose an in, as an initial condition the, for instance, a unit vector z. Okay, how do I see that there is a constant here? Okay, <coughs> the equation for E3 is 
de3 ds is omega uh, vector product with e3 okay um, all right but because omega is only is is proportional to e3 that here the equation for e3 has an e3 times e3 but the cross product of two parallel vectors is zero okay so the e3 ds you can see immediately is zero therefore e3 is has to be a constant all right okay and uh, if i solve this the other two equations for e1 and e2 i see that this the, the solution for e1 and e2 is is very simple here also i choose an initial condition where e1 of uh, 0 is z uh, x okay and e2 of 0 is y okay so these are the solution so what is this describing physically this is a a twisted straight rod first of all is describing a curve where the the tangent the unit tangent is a constant so it's a straight polymer straight conformation but e1 and e2 are they keep rotating and they keep rotating always in the xy plane right so e3 so you have to imagine e3 straight a constant equal to z and e1 and e2 they keep rotating and they rotate with an angular frequency omega 3 so this omega 3 describes actually what is the twist a twist deformation when omega 3 is non-zero you have a twist in your polymer okay and omega 3 is more specifically is a twist density so to find the total twist i define the total twist of the polymer as the integral of omega 3 over ds over the whole length of the polymer and I can normalize this. I divide it by two pi normally, by convention. Okay, so this is the uh, the total twist. All right. So if we go back to the example of the of the DNA. Okay. So okay, this is uh, we have seen here. We are just considering uh, a configuration with omega three is is um, so our omega just on constant omega three times e three. Okay, we have seen that this is a, a twisted straight rod. Okay, uh, we know that in uh, DNA, the E1 and E2, so it's it's a double helix. So this you see here the more detailed atomistic structure of the of the DNA. This this double helix E1 and E2 rotate as uh, as soon as you move along the S, they rotate with a constant angular frequency, and the angular frequency. Is, is called omega here omega naught small omega naught okay so the double helix has an intrinsic twist density which is omega naught and this omega naught okay and by the way all these omegas have the dimension of one over the length okay to calculate this omega naught for the double helix i know that uh, you know the, the the length after a distance uh, of 10.5 base pairs okay uh, the helix has made one the double helix has made uh, one full turn okay so this l is 10.5 base pairs and the distance between base pairs is 0 0.33 nanometers so this is an inverse of a length and if i calculate it's 1.75 nanometers to the power minus one so this is the intrinsic twist density of the double helix the double helix the DNA double helix in its ground state is uh, is described by a, it's it's a straight rod, okay, where E1 and E2 keep rotating with a constant angular frequency, which is given by 1.75 nanometer to the minus one, okay, right. So this was for omega is equal to omega three, okay. So now what if we take Omega is equal to omega one. Okay, so there is omega. Uh, it's a constant again, and it has only a, a non-zero component, omega one. So omega two and omega three are zero. Okay, and I have again. I can solve the equation one, and uh, you know the solution is exactly the same as before. I mean, it can can be redone, but now the difference is that e one is a constant, right? And e two and e three they keep rotating with the angular frequency omega one you can you can simple 
simply realize once you have the previous one you can also derive this uh, this one with a relabeling of the of the of the axis okay and now let's have a look at e3 now our e3 is not a constant anymore right you see that is changing as the we describe the polymer as s changes okay this e3 is not a constant vector so this is not a conformation a straight conformation anymore but it's a bent conformation all right it's a bent conformation and how is precisely the shape of the polymer we know that e3 is the unit tangent so to find the position so the, the shape of the curve of our polymer r of s we just have to integrate the unit tangent okay so we integrate of e3 s prime the s prime so there is an s prime here missing from 0 to s and as s moves from 0 to l i describe the shape of my polymer the integral of this is very simple we are integrating trigonometric functions and this is the the result what is this as a shape it's very easy to, to see it's a circle and the circle has a radius one over omega one okay and analogously we can have we can do the same for uh, the other choice omega two so omega is equal to omega two times e two with omega two is constant okay we will have another circle and and uh, with another uh, uh, with the, with the radius huh? so so there are two bending modes here this this omega 1 and omega 2 are called bending modes and you can <coughs> realize that you can bend a polymer into two different orientations right like uh, perhaps we can go back and show this on the previous on the first very first picture that we had in this presentation Okay, so if you have a polymer now, imagine this uh, this polymer here. You can see it, but like a, like a, it has a, rect a rectangular shape. Okay, let's assume that there is no twist. Okay, so it's a rectangular. So you can bend it in two different ways along the longer um, side or along the, the shorter side. Okay, so these are the two bending modes that we have, and these are described by these two. Uh, components omega 1 and omega 2 and then we have the omega 3 that describes the twist okay so let's go back to our discussions we were here in the in explaining what is twist and what is bending mode so this omega 1 and omega 2 describe two bending modes and the omega 3 describe the twist mode okay the most generic conformation of uh, of a polymer like DNA and so we will it will have different omegas that will depend in gen the most generic uh, conformation that will depend on s okay they will uh, they will depend on s you can have a, a part of the polymer which is more straight and a part which is more bent okay so in the straight part you know that omega 1 and omega 2 are equal to 0 and uh, in the part which is more bent you know that omega 1 and omega 2 are uh, yeah can be significantly non, non, non zero okay remember that the curvature is given by the square root of omega 1 square plus omega 2 square all right so we were here okay so we have seen here these two ideal cases just to discuss uh, okay just but in the most generic case we cannot really solve this uh, this differential equation all right okay so this is our differential equations let's go back to it and let's think a bit more what what it means okay what it means okay so let's this this is the differential equation that we have seen we write it to two different ways okay but let's continue let's consider this way omega cross product with EI. So let's instead of having just uh, applying to a un the unit uh, base vectors, apply let's apply these to a generic vector omega. Okay, and in particular, I am interested in the infinitesimal increment of this vector, generic vector omega. Okay, and I'm looking at this increment in a specific place s. Okay, all right. So the vector omega will uh, increment and will change infinitesimally of an amount d omega which is given by this uh, this term 
Okay, so if this vector omega, small omega, is parallel to the omega, then this this vector, the omega, this increment, the omega is has zero length. Okay, is zero because uh, you know this cross product is zero. If this small vector omega is perpendicular to omega, then this d omega is just given by the absolute in uh, so the length of this increment is just uh, you know it's just given by the length the product of the length of the vectors okay so this has a very simple geometrical interpretation <coughs> and is actually this differential equation this infinitesimal differential equation is describing a rotation right a rotation uh, so around the rotation axis is this capital omega okay in this drawing this capital omega okay i assume this uh, these situations right small omega is perpendicular to capital omega capital omega is a vector which is coming out of the plane of the slide okay and this d omega is the cross product of capital omega times d omega and is uh, it's, uh, it's therefore it's pointing into this uh, this direction okay and the interpretation of this omega um, um, capital omega length the capital omega time ts is the infinitesimal rotation angle okay so i can see these differential equations as a set of infinitesimal rotations from point to point okay so the next uh, topic we want to discuss is what is that is that of euler angles so this is another representation of the same uh, the same story okay so again it turns to be convenient sometimes instead of using this this vector omega to describe the shape of a polymer to um, to describe the shape of our polymer or this, the shape of these uh, triad unit vectors as rotations with respect to a fixed lab frame so e1 e2 e3 so suppose we are doing some experiment Okay, we are in the lab this is a fixed lab frame okay and our uh, polymer our dna assumes uh, fluctuating conformations so you can have explore different conformations okay and i can describe any of this conformation by uh, constructing a rotation matrix that at any point s rotates this frame into the frame into the, the darbu frame at, at position s then I move to S prime and so on to any points. Okay. In other words, the same configurations of the polymer can be obtained by having defining a rotation matrix, uh, rotation R, that depends on the uh, position S that rotates this lab frame into the physical Darbu frame at that uh, at that point. Okay. So this is the same the same information. So R is a rotation matrix. We know a few things about rotation matrices so the inverse so the, the rotation matrices have this property the transpose of a rotation matrix times the matrix itself or r times r transpose is the identity or in other words the inverse of a rotation matrix is the transposed okay so the element ij of a rotation matrix is is a transposed uh, so is just r of j i okay now we can start working with this equation and we differentiate this with respect of s okay so this is given by the derivative of this times this i j naught but this i j naught i can write it also as the inverse of this equation the inverse is just the transposed okay so I replaced with aj0 as the transposed times the vector ek. So I have exactly the same, very similar, well, the, the same differential equation that we had in the previous pages, okay? But now just written in, in terms of rotation matrices. Rotation matrices of a fixed frame into the local frame, okay? And so what I find that here I have a same matrix what i call m in the previous slides okay but now it's given by d the, the derivative of the matrix r times r transposed okay 
All right. Okay. So this is our matrix M. Okay. Now, there is a way to parameterize rotation by using angles. I will not enter very much into the details here, but we can always decompose a, a, a generic rotation from one frame to another frame, okay, uh, in terms of some three angles. And the way I define it here is by means of what is called the Euler angles, okay. And um, what, how are these Euler angles defined? Okay, so here the idea is that I rotate a frame, the blue frame, the frame uh, small x, small y, small z, into the red frame that I indicate with capital X, capital Y, capital Z. Okay, and uh, I can do this rotation, and this is an image from Wikipedia. Okay, I can do this rotation in three elementary steps. Okay, first I rotate of an angle alpha uh, around uh, Z, okay, I rotate and around uh, uh, now uh, alpha and at this point the vector X points along the green vector N, then I do a rotation of this uh, vector uh, around the vector N and this is a rotation of an amount beta which is described here, by doing this rotation of beta I tilt the Z into a Z prime, so sorry, the small Z into capital Z, okay? And then I do again a rotation around this capital uh, Z, okay, of an angle gamma, okay? So I can write uh, this any rotation matrix as a product actually of three matrices. And these three matrices that describe alpha, gamma, and beta. Here I use the, normally we use this convention here, not alpha, beta, and gamma for polymers. We are using three angles, phi, theta, and psi. Okay. And uh, if I take this, actually, and I write this, the product of these three matrices, I get this, uh, this matrix here. Okay. This is the Euler angle parameterization of, um, uh, of a rotation matrix. Okay. Now, I can rewrite, okay, this, uh, for instance, I can, I can redo the calculations that I, I, I've done in the, in the previous, so, pages, uh, in the previous slides, I've seen that M is actually a um, combination of all those capital omegas, right? So, if we go back, I'm showing this, no, this matrix M was defined here as an anti-symmetrics matrix with omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 with the sum signs, okay? Now I've seen in this last slide that this actually this M is actually given by the derivative of R with respect of S and R of T. Given that R has this shape, it's perhaps a bit complicated calculation, but I can take the derivative all these and I have to differentiate and also all these angles will depend on S okay so when I take the derivative with respect of S I have to differentiate with respect Psi with respect of S and Phi and Theta okay so um, and it's a calculation and then I have to take the transposed okay and then I take the product of the two and I can find the elements of this matrix matrix and it will turn out that this matrix is very simple to show that this matrix is anti-symmetric and so I can identify what is omega 1, omega 2 and omega 3 in this new uh, uh, Euler angle representation and this is the result of the calculation okay so uh, in what follows sometimes we will use the omega representation sometimes for instead of using the capital omegas we will use the Euler angle representation so you see this dot actually they mean the derivative with respect of s okay so when you take the derivative with respect of s by all these elements you get a psi dot you get a phi dot and you get also a theta dot okay so you see again the bending and the twist expressed now in a different form in the 
in Euler, Euler angle, okay? Good, so this is another representation. When are we using Euler angles or the omega representation? It depends from, from problem to, to problem, okay? We'll see it a bit later. Finally, now we are reading to, uh, to introduce a bit of a physical, more physical model, right? So we want to have energies and discuss energies and, and so on, okay? So the equation that we have given, and now I give, uh, so what I introduce here is the twistable worm-like chain model and introduce it specifically as a model for, uh, for DNA. So we have seen in the previous slides that the shape of the molecule is completely described by this differential equation. So by having different omegas, I will describe different shapes of DNA with a little bit more bending, with a little bit more twisting and so on in one direction, on the other direction, so depending on the, sh on the, on the values of the omegas of the vector omegas, okay? And uh, here I write already uh, it in a form that is familiar for, for DNA. So when all this vector capital omega is equal to zero, okay, when this capital omega is equal to zero, this differential equation, just with these terms, describe a twisted straight rod. Okay, that I assume that this that's the ground state for for my DNA. So that the DNA, if I let it and I, it relaxes to its minimal energy configuration, is just a straight rod. Okay, with this intrinsic twist omega naught. Okay, so for the minimal state for this my my DNA molecule is uh, is just a twisted straight rod. In other words, omega is equal to zero as a vector. Okay. This is my, somehow, the ground, so this is the configuration with the minimal energy, with the ground state. Now let's make an, let's make an expansion around this uh, minimal energy, okay, and let's uh, make an expansion of it. So this defines my, I define my energy as an expansion around this minimum, okay. Here I omit the energy of this minimum itself because it will be irrelevant for the statistical mechanics calculation that we, we do next but it's uh, when we expand around the minimum you know the first derivative so the linear term around the minimum are zero right it's only quadratic terms that I get it's like when I expand in classical mechanics a uh, potential around the minimum, okay, I get the constant plus quadratic term, I actually get quadratic form around that. And the idea here is exactly the same, right? So uh, expanding, the first term will be quadratic in omega one, omega two, and omega three, and then I will have plus higher order terms, okay? So this is the a very generic assumptions about my energy, assuming, okay, that's the ground state, and this is an expansion in small omegas, okay? So I'm considering small omegas, so I consider in situations where the deformations are small, okay? And uh, in this uh, in this expansion, so you, you can also ask yourself, but well, generically, I will also have other quadratic terms, like I could have omega 1 times omega 2, or omega 2 times omega 3, and so on. So, yeah, this is also a possibility, but in our uh, description, how we will assume now for the time being that there are no such cross uh, terms, that just the, the expansion is just, uh, is just of this kind. So we will have omega 1, Omega two and omega three, as and and in as in uh, yeah, in classical mechanics, there will be some coefficients that describe the curvature of this parabolic uh, of this of this parabola. These are a one, a two, are called c. Okay, right. So and these are all the uh, also called the, the the stiffness. Okay. So if we assume now that okay. I hope that this, this, this is clear, the dots denote higher order terms. And of course, this is an expansion that I do for every point. So this omega one in general depends on S, okay? And omega two will depend on S, okay? And, and so is omega three. So it's, uh, it's not quite as, uh, as a potential energy as a, just a function of the coordinate, but here these omegas are fields that depends on, on S itself, okay? 
Now, so if we assume, as we will do, that uh, that this is uh, the bending is uh, isotropic, so I will assume that a1 and a2 actually have are identical and they are equal to a. Okay, then I get a simpler uh, model that has only two parameters a and c. Okay, and uh, it can be shown quite easily also that omega 1 square plus omega 2 square is just the derivative of the tangent with respect of s squared. But we recognize just in this first term, actually, this is the worm like chain model right when written in this form this is exactly the worm like chain and this a is the persistence length the bending persistence length okay now on top of that we have also the twist variable the c omega 3 squared okay so this is what is called here in this form is the simplest isotropic twistable worm like chain model that is assumed considered to be a good model for for instance elasticity of dna uh, describing small deformations of, of, of DNA. Of course, we um, assume that we are describing just the quadratic term and not, uh, and not, the, and not what is uh, above that. Okay. We can sometimes, we will use another representation of the same model in terms of Euler angles. Okay. So if you go to the previous slide and you uh, get omega 1, and omega 2 as a function of uh, the Euler angles and you calculate this uh, omega 1 square plus omega 2 square you get this expression and this is the twist uh, squared okay so sometimes we will use this uh, this other either this or or this depending on the on the situations we are going to study okay so but this is uh, this is a uh, beta this is a uh, the twistable worm like chain model and from there we can do statistical mechanics uh, of um, you know of it and uh, explore uh, uh, several properties okay just a final remark uh, this a and c are elastic what is called the elastic constant okay of uh, and for dna we know already that the persistence length is about 50 nanometers i should always add now bending persistence length because this a describes the bending deformations so it's 50 nanometers and it turns out that the torsional per torsional stiffness and we will see how it is connected to the torsional persistence length uh, in the next lectures it's uh, about 100 nanometers okay so it's roughly twice as, as large as the as the a so these are the two um, uh, two elastic constants that describe the, the physics of DNA